ask me, dear and faithful Fulvia, for an account of some of the rumors which have already reached you concerning Pontius and myself, and you appear frightened at the mystery by which we are enveloped. Read this, my scroll, and give to me at least an understanding. For, oh, Fulvia, I am the wife of the man who condemned Christ Jesus to death. Even here, in this little Gallic mountain town where Pontius and I have been driven, he by remorse, I by the scorn of Rome as well as that of Jerusalem, if even here children slink away from us and women draw their veils closer, let me believe that somewhere some woman will understand, even as she, the mother of Jesus, would have understood. But first, remember my childhood in Narbonne. You will recall that I had scarcely completed my 15th year when I was betrothed to Pontius, then holding an honorable position in Illyria. I had never seen Pontius before my marriage feast, nor did I know any love, nor how that flame may burn within the human breast. Pontius somewhat praised my beauty, and I know he esteemed my wealth, for he was ambitious. Love, he held a weakness fit only for women, for he was at the same time a philosopher. Although the flute players played all night before my bridal chamber, they did not know I lay alone, for Pontius had put me from him, saying, I seek truth, the truth of life. Often he would stay the night in his library, closeted with his scribes, and against the dawn and my empty arms pose the question, what is truth? Thus five years passed before I became wife enough to be a mother. I lived a new life in the rapture of my child. But Fulvia, only love can beget love and its perfect image. My son Pilo, so beautiful, so bright in his smile that the very slaves looked up when he passed. My son had a withered foot. But soon he learned to walk with a very little crutch. Pontius was divided between his chagrin and a son who could not be a soldier, and pride that he yet had an heir to his name, old as Rome itself. Ambition stirred the politician in him when Caesar's favor named him Council of Judea, for this was a step toward Egypt. Thus we came to Jerusalem. None of all the vast lands that paid tribute to Rome was more beautiful than these purple hills folding back into yellow sands. Roses and scented myrtle trailed to every rooftop, while the palms, lovelier even than those at Delos, waved above gnarled gray olive trees, or groves of oranges, or those scarlet pomegranates of which their Solomon had sung. Above all, even above our Roman courts, towered the mighty temple of Jerusalem, its sacrificial smoke smudging the sky. But all the flattering pomps and pageantries of our coming mocked us. The Hebrews detested us in our court of idolatrous pagans, as they styled my countrymen. These Jews were a turbulent people and very heady. Their thousand sects were united only in their hate of Rome. Some few believe the time had come for a Messiah to appear, who would make himself king and overthrow our own power. In this we felt them secretly abetted by Herod, not for any treason, but that he had a cousin who would supplant Pontius. Now he would show that Pontius could not rule these peoples. We were a portion part of the palace of Herod and were much beholden to him. Austere and very just in his judgments here, 
My husband judged not the ache in my heart, nor turned to me then even as to a faithful servant. Had it not been for my boy Pilo, I would have died of loneliness in Jerusalem. My boy became my love, my life. Withered though his foot was, he was brave and threw away his crutch early and endured without any protest all the torments of the pullers and straighteners paunches brought increasingly. For more and more he looked to our son. At this time, we had acquaintance with one Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue. When Pontius would argue with him his philosophy, I would sit with his wife Salome in the woman's court where the fountain is and embroider upon my veils. They had an only child, Semidia. She had then just reached her twelfth year and was lovely as those dawn roses which in all the world grow only at Jerusalem. When Pontius spread out his hands against the argument of Jairus, I, in my loneliness, listened to Salome. First in my court, then many times on her own roof, she whispered to me of a carpenter of Nazareth, one named Jesus, who walked among these people, healing the sick, curing lepers, making the dumb cry out, the blind to see. And now, he had made a lame child leap up whole. A lame child. Oh, Fulvia. Now others, unbelievers, politicians, the Pharisees themselves began to talk of this Jesus. Herod told us he had taken a tribute piece from a fish's mouth and laughed heartily and so did all. Then they said he raised a man of Bethany from the dead. Soon all Jerusalem rang with this Jesus. But in his discourse was no miracle, only the healing of empty cleverness with simple truth. Salome told me that he said, you must become as a little child to know God. But Pontius forbade us or any of the household to approach Jesus. For Pontius was very learned, nor would he wish to become as a child. When once I pleaded, he put me by with, Yes, yes, I know this Jesus had turned water into wine. He multiplied a few loaves and fishes to feed many. He disappeared out of a crowded room, but so the conjurers of the East have done. Let him show me how it is done, so I myself may do these things, and when I do them, I may believe. I want truth, not any trickery. Hold thyself, Claudia Procula, very high. Thou art a Roman's wife. But now I pitied Pontius. He had many cares and a very lean look. His rulings took him often from us. And then he had lost his taste for life itself, as one who, grown arid among his parchments, could not see what was real before himself. Many wise men are so, Fulvia. A strange sickness fell upon us that summer. Its malice gathered with the heat. Particularly, it wasted children with a torpor like of death itself. So it numbed my boy. He thinned, whitened, fell. Even Pilate was roused. He sent runners to Athens, to Alexandria, to Rome itself for drafts. Yet the weakness increased. Now the gentle sweetness of my boy was scarcely of earth. I trembled. Then Semedia, the child of Jairus, and Salome was stricken, and quickly. The night she died, the physicians also turned away from my boy's couch. Pilate, to meet the end, closeted himself with his stoics. I was alone with my dying Pilo and his tutor Mata, a Greek slave to Pontius. Now Mata pressed a tablet into my hand. It was from Jairus. It said, Jesus will come to Samedia, even dead. Do thou bring Pilo. A faint trembling light shot into my soul. All else had failed. My child's last breath was almost burned out. 
could he, this Jesus, save my son? Scarcely knowing it was my own voice, my arms, my substantial self, I followed Mata. He held Pilo very gently and glided softly, swiftly into the dawn like a shadow with a shadow. I had not known it, but Mata was a follower of Jesus. When we came to the street of Jairus, our chariot could not proceed farther. The crowd was so great. Mata would not have us known imperially, so I stood heavily veiled as a mourner. Thus I was slowly given passage through the outer whalers and the flute players and the many poor and those fisher folk who follow Jesus and those Pharisees and scribes who seek the more to trap him into treason against Caesar. These would give me no entrance beyond the vestibule, for they wished not witnesses. But, oh, Fulvia, to have gained thus far, and now to fail my chance to ask for Pilo his life of Jesus. Then at the head of the stairway I saw J. Iris. Before the authority of his hand, a way opened upward. But when I was at the bedchamber door, J. Iris quickly withdrew, and I could not move farther nor yet descend again. I could only wait there, pressed, agonizing. So I saw into the chamber of death, and through the clouds of thick incense, Semidia lying upon her funeral bier, very white with complete death. Beside her, utterly bowed was Salome, and many burning candles and many faces. I saw him, Fulvia. Then I saw Jesus. Scarcely did he seem a man to my first sight, nor yet a person. Though his face and hands, his very garments, were as of those of them about him, rather he was some presence, some undefined feeling of the very loveliness of love itself. All the chamber seemed full of the fullness of his love. Like an empty vase now filled with precious spikenard, so I felt all the heights and depths of my being flooded with the loveliness of Jesus. Nor was there any bitterness left in me. Only love. Suddenly I saw J. Iris throw himself upon his knees before Jesus. He cried, Lord, my daughter is dead. Say but the word and she shall be healed. A shudder ran through my frame. My very soul hung upon his words. Then Jesus took Samedia by the hand and said, Arise, Fulvia. She obeyed him. She arose, her eyes opened upon us all. Slowly her face flushed with life. She looked into the eyes of Jesus. Then she threw out her arms and cried, My mother! I did not know that I had fallen upon my knees, but presently I was aware of the trampling crowd. There were shouts about me, but so strangely few of joy, and these alone from the household. More were of hate, and many hissed. I turned desperately every which way to try to get to Jesus, but the crowd pushed me down the steep stair and tidied me farther and farther until I sobbed with my despair. Now I knew I could not ask Jesus to heal Pilo. So they pushed me through the shadows of hate and the Pharisees who called him loudly, Blasphemer, hater of Caesar, until I was forced into a little passageway roofed with gourds. And there I heard a cry. It will ring forever in my ears. Mother, mother! Through all the multitude sprang Pilo into my arms. Pilo, erect and firm without any sickness in him. And more, nay more, he dragged no withered foot. My Pilo leaped, walked, danced, all sound. His feet were lovely as his face. 
Apollo, my son, made a hole. Before I had asked of Jesus, he had heard more than I had asked. He had granted. Oh, Fulvia. Now I must struggle to write to you of what follows. My words are difficult. Beyond Pontius' pride and Palo made whole, beyond his love for the boy which sprang newborn from out the very cheers of the soldiers, for Palo was now a very marvel of sport and joy. Pontius must satisfy his own mind, for the heart he reckoned not. There is some trickery here, he said. This man is but a carpenter and without education, and I am a man of learning. I must search the matter closely before you or yet Pilo may see again this Jesus. Pilate wanted further to be appointed at Egypt and wished to be thought well of by Herod and so by Caesar. We went with Herod that spring into the deep sea, nor did we return until the paschal time of the Jews was at hand. This famed feast yearly gathered together at Jerusalem numbers from all the tribes of Israel to offer sacrifice. The day before their feast, Pontius said to me, The fates are against your Jesus of Nazareth. A price has been put upon his head, and before eventide he will be delivered up to the chief priests. But, Father, you will save Jesus, of course. When Pilo said this, easily, Pontius put the boy at once away with Mata to the hills, for he would not look into his eyes, nor would he allow me even to converse that day with any outside, but bade me severely to keep to my woman's court. He looked haggard, desperate with uncertainty. <laughs> I could not sleep that night for the calling of Jesus' face. When the last bugle of the temple sounded, I was like one who dreams awake. And this was the dream I dreamed. I saw a great hillside, and it was covered with all the children Jesus had healed. Pilo and Samedia were there, and many, many others. And beside them were their fathers and mothers, and all of every kind and degree who were joined into a kindred by the love of Jesus. And there were those also who had been healed in heart and mind, as well as body, and more who had needed not healing, but only the right to love life itself. None were idle, but all worked with the hands of the mind, and both the hands and faces sang and shone, and all were refreshed in their work, for each had found the outlet of his peculiar genius. So this was a new race, and young and old, this one thing lay upon their faces, for in the love of Jesus all were as children, and without fear or greed, but greatly glorified. So their unfolding of themselves was like a canticle of unceasing beauty. Then apart, wrapped in a swollen, angry cloud, drifted without aim many others. These were not as children, but very aged, with a toil which brought them always to work in a circle back to themselves. And they cursed this and that and pursued lust and power and cried in an agony of fear. So their cries were horrible and their sufferings very great. And Pontius, the philosopher, the politician, the consul, was among them. And his arms were worn away from entreating Pilo from afar off to turn to him. And so Pontius cried out to me. And in my sweat of pity, for Pontius was a just man and very learned, I awoke. I ran to his bedchamber crying, Pontius, Pontius, believe. 
Cease thy philosophies, believe as a little child on Jesus. My maids laughed me to scorn for my night cry and said, The governor is in the judgment seat, there is somewhat there. And now a murmur swelled loudly from the city with sudden yells. My heart throbbed as though it would burst from me. I heard the tread of many feet other than the iron-shod soldiers upon the marble court below leading to the praetorium. I flew to Pontius. He was seated in the tribunal. I drew aside the purple curtain. I saw, oh, Fulvia, I saw Jesus. Pilo's Jesus. His hands were tied. The cords cut into his bones and his face was streaming blood. But in all the agony of his body, which was very beaten about, his eyes were full of love. So he looked gently upon Pontius, who was frenzied with doubt now. The crowd pressed about Jesus uncommonly, the soldiers and scribes and Pharisees, the drunken, the lowest of night rabble. Nor did I see any friend near Jesus. They had brought him from the priests in the garden and kicking, striking him, had maimed each other as himself. And he healed many. The very demons peered out of their terrible faces and Pilate was unable to decide his sentence for he was afraid for his ambition. Now he would ask questions of them and now of Jesus. And Pontius was white with fear. I heard him say again, what is it you ask of me to do to this just man? What evil has he done? And then he swayed a little and said, has he not healed some of you? Nor then would he look at the eyes of Jesus. Their high priest, Caiaphas, made answer, we ask the death of this man, for he would make himself king here instead of Caesar. Pontius, like one who would increase time, asked directly of Jesus, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus looked into Pontius deeply, as to open a gap into his subtleties. Oh, Fulvia, that look of the blood-stained Christ. He asked not for help from Pontius, even at this hour, when he had no friend, but rather sought to find the healing way to his own judge. He said, Dost thou ask this of thine own self, or dost another self speak for thee? And Pontius turned in an agony, for he could not decide, and the roar of the crowd was great. Then Jesus said to Pontius, as if alone in that shrieking madness, My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is the truth that lies within you, as within all born into this world. To reveal thyself in truth am I come. Pilate leaned forward, and I thought, now, now he will deliver Jesus. But the crowd cried suddenly, He is opposed to Caesar, who is friend to this man is no friend to Caesar. Then I saw fear, like a substance hard and white, slip over the face, the hands, the very robes of Pontius. He looked this way and that, at the guards, the crowds, the priests. Then he said dryly, like a philosopher, What is truth? and stayed not for any answer. At the corridor leading to the Sanhedrin, I fell before Pontius on my knees. Pontius, I cried, this is Jesus, Jesus, the very Christ, the Son of God. And Pontius, it is Pilos, dear Jesus, he who healed our boy, have no part in his death. I have suffered many things in a dream this night of him. For thine own sake, for even the sake of all those judges in this world who will come after thee and judge in Christ's name without fear. For our child, for me, Claudia, thy wife, Pontius, save Jesus the Christ. But Pontius' sweat was gray upon his face. 
he could not decide. He said and staggered, This is fearful. Now am I in hell. I cannot stem this outbreak of the priests, for they are powerful here. Herod has asked me to make an example of this man. If not, he will speak ill of me to Caesar. And if this Jesus be the truth or not, I cannot decide, for I am a philosopher and must argue the matter further. My mind rejects this man who is but a carpenter. And yet, he pushed his hands forward and groaned from his deeps. I feel, I feel. Then the guards came forward. They stepped briskly, for they held scourging of fine sport. And a shriek rose everywhere, crucify him. Then I heard the sound of splitting flesh when I came to the outer prison yard. Even in my faint, something of myself saw very clearly Jesus bound to a pillar and standing in a red pool of his own blood. And Pretorius, one of our bodyguard, whose broken hand Jesus had once healed, now scourged him the hardest. They put a crown of thorns on his head and pressed it down, and the eyes bulged. They wrapped him in an old fine robe of Pontius' own, and Pontius staggered even in the judgment seat and said like a dead man, why, I find no fault in him. And he washed his hands in the silver gilt basin and sought every which way increasingly to save Jesus. But they would not release him, even for the custom of their Passover, but preferred some robber whose name has now left me. A runner brought a scroll with the secret seal of Herod, saying, Have done quickly with all prisoners this night, for tomorrow I set early for Rome and would speak well of thee to Caesar. Pontius and Herod had made themselves into friends that day, one to further the other with Caesar. When Pontius said to the mob, what shall I do with this man? They shrieked as one, crucify him as you are Caesar's friend, crucify him. He delivered Jesus unto them. Before Pontius departed, he wrote this title for the cross. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Thou, O Fulvia, who art a Christian, need not be told of what followed. Thou knowest how Jesus himself dragged his cross to the hill of death and at the last of his agony died upon it and that Mary, his mother, stood with him to the end and so looked upon her son who had healed my son and was condemned by mine own husband unto death. In the fever and long delirium that seized upon Pontius, we lived terribly through many terrible events. For at the death of our Jesus, the earth trembled and darkness fell upon us. And many, even our centurion, said, This was in truth the Son of God. And many more believed on him when he rolled the stone away from his own sepulchre and walked among his people in company with his disciples, who now themselves did heal and teach his words. But now, though my soul was on its knees before Christ in supplication for Pontius, Pontius could not believe, but studied increasingly and was wretched to look upon. Such calamity fell upon him, my heart ached for this man, my husband. Blow on blow fell on Pontius, even as once the scourge on Christ. When Pilo returned and heard his father had condemned Jesus to death, he fell and was dead. Nor did I wish him to live, for never could my child have forgiven his father, for he loved Jesus very dearly. 
Then Herod, for whose fear Pontius had delivered Jesus, spoke against Pontius privately to Caesar, and had his own cousin appointed at Jerusalem. And Pilate was judged and sentenced by the Senate at Rome unjustly, for there were false witnesses. He suffered greatly in this, for until he falsely judged the Christ, he had been very upright. With his honor, he lost his friends. His lands at Rome were taken, and he had at the last no penny, but must walk like a slave. His library was scattered. Gnawed with his remorse, Pilate sees in me the witness to his crime, and everywhere we feel the eyes of the Christians burning into us, as did those eyes of Christ. At their meetings, they tell the life of Jesus and have a sentence which forever sentences Pontius. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. Pontius is a scholar and knows that words live forever. So his own learning too betrayed him. Now are we driven to this mountain crag in Gallia, whence Euphonius will bring you this scroll. Pontius has become old and ill and very weak. So he is at last a child. In his weakness is my hope. Oh, Fulvia, if only now, when every moment pressed to his last, if now the learned mind would cease its doubts and forget itself in the love of Christ, and with the pitiful heart be healed, as once was healed my Pilo. If now he, my husband, who for fear of others condemned Jesus to death, could without fear go to his own judgment by the Son of God. Ye who pray, pray now for Pontius. 